Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the AFNES 2020 virtual conference. I'm Christine Radarski. I'm your current AFNES president, and we're delighted to see you here with us today. This isn't exactly what we had expected when we planned this conference. We had expected to be gathering in Oswego this week. Um, it's been a difficult and challenging year for all of us, but we are happy to have you join us, and we're um, happy to be able to bring this virtual conference to you and to bring it to you for free. Uh, this is going to be an experiment for us all. I think a lot of us are new to Zoom and new to this technology, so we hope that you'll bear with us all through this process. If you need help throughout today's sessions or, or tomorrow's, we have someone monitoring the chat box in every session. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a button for the chat that will pop up a window where you can enter your comments. Also, we are monitoring the uh, website for AFNI, or not the website, I'm sorry, the email for AFNIs, which is publichistoriansnys at gmail.com. So go ahead and send emails too, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. If you're not already a member of AFNIs, I hope that this conference will encourage you to join. We provide wonderful resources for all of our historians, and we look forward to showing you what we have to offer throughout the conference today and tomorrow. We really are excited to be able to bring this conference to you. And normally this conference would not be free. We do char charge registration fees for our annual conference, but because of the situation this year and because of the support that we've received from our conference sponsor, the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, we made the decision to offer this conference for free this year because we know a lot of our historians, whether your members or not, are struggling during this time period. And we felt it was really important for us to be able to bring everyone together and connect during this difficult time. And so we are extremely grateful to our conference sponsor, the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, and we have a message from them to welcome us today. Matt? Hi, I'm Bill Pomeroy, trustee and founder of the William G. Pomeroy Foundation based in Syracuse. We are delighted to be back again for our eighth year as a conference sponsor. We've had a lot of fun at this conference and keep coming back because we want to help you celebrate your community's history. We do this by providing grants to fully fund historic roadside markers. Nationwide, we have funded over 1,200 roadside markers and plaques across all our signage programs. Tomorrow, you will learn all about that during our morning session, Historic Markers and Primary Sources. We'll talk about the importance of primary sources and how that makes Pomeroy markers special. When your grant is approved, you know you will receive the gold standard of historic markers. To learn more, join the discussion at our virtual forum today or tomorrow during the lunch break. Check out our ad at your conference program. It looks like this and it has our contact information and website, wgpfoundation.org. You visit us there to explore our various marker grant programs. Perhaps you'll get an idea for a marker for your community. Thank you. And now we are delighted to welcome you to the plenary session of our conference on the Inclusive Historians Handbook. And we are especially pleased to be able to welcome the editors and contributors to the handbook. Speakers will be Madupe Labode from the National Museum of American History, Kimberly Springle from the Charles Sumner School Museum and Archives, William S. Walker from the Cooperstown Graduate Program at SUNY Oneonta, and a face a lot of you will recognize our former New York State historian, Robert Weibel. So we're delighted to have you all with us today, and we think that this is going to be a wonderful program. So thank you for joining us, and I'll turn the program over to Will to start. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Christine. It's really wonderful to be here with all of you this morning virtually. I uh, spend a lot of time with my students these days on Zoom, but it's wonderful now to be connecting with colleagues in this way. Uh, I'm going to share. You know, just a second. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, so uh, Christine was kind enough to give us brief introductions there, but we thought we would tell you a little bit more about ourselves and, uh, and then we'll tell you uh, more about the Inclusive Historians Handbook and how we think it might be useful to you in the work you do as public historians. So Madupe, you wanna get us started? Yes, um, my name is Majipe Labodi, and currently I'm a curator at the National Museum of American History where I'm specializing in uh, African-American social justice history. I've been here for about 13 months. And before that, I, was, I taught history and museum studies in Indianapolis at IUPUI. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kimberly Springle, and I am currently the executive director at the Charles Sumner School Museum and Archives, also in Washington, DC. And um, my particular site, I have been the steward of this site for the past 12 years now, time flies. It is the official museum and repository preserving, interpreting, and sharing the history of DC's public education system. And I'm Will Walker. Uh, I teach public history, oral history at uh, the Cooperstown Graduate Program, which uh, is a two-year museum studies uh, master's degree program, uh, which is part of SUNY Oneonta. And uh, I do a lot of work with local history. I uh, oversee uh, an oral history project. Uh, and uh, I grew up in uh, Oyster Bay. And uh, so I have a, a lifelong connection to New York history and uh, have uh, connections with the Oyster Bay Historical Society. Uh, and so I'm very passionate about and invested in community history, local history in New York State. Uh, good morning. I'm Bob Weibel. I'm currently the uh, president of the Schenectady County Historical Society. And I hope you can hear me. Um, my microphone doesn't always work well. Um, and as um, Christine mentioned, I was previously the chief curator of the uh, New York State Museum and the uh, state historian. Um, maybe a few of you remember that. Um, I know I do. And um, it's good to be uh, speaking to you again. Um, your conference is better than ever, and I suspect that's a reflection of your leadership. Um, you have a great state historian in Devin Lander and a wonderful president in Christine Radarski. Um, my only regret here is that we're not meeting in person because it would be great to get together and have some face-to-face -face conversation. Um, maybe next year, who knows, until then. Back to Will. Okay. All right, so we know a little bit, but Kimberly's going to take the lead here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. So thank you all for being here this morning. Um, we have introduced ourselves and we want to know a little bit about you as well. Um, the announcement has been made to go ahead in the chat box, which is located in the center of your screen at the bottom. Go ahead and, and type in your first name and where you are coming from. Um, also, please share with us what you hope to get out of this session. We're constantly um, seeking feedback, so that's very helpful to us. Also, feel free to engage throughout the session if you have any comments that come up. And any questions, even before the Q&A session, please use the chat feature and input that information as it will be monitored and will retrieve pertinent questions at the end of our presentation. And welcome and thank you for being here. And I'll just say to my fellow presenters, I'm having a hard time seeing the chat right now because of the slideshow. So if you catch anything, just give me a nudge. Okay. So um, I would like to just provide an overview of the, um, of the Inclusive Historian's Handbook. And I'll do my best in this presentation not to read at you because I don't think anyone really enjoys that. Um, so part of the, um, when this was proposed, this came out 
of a proposal from people who do state and local history at the AASLH meeting. And so initially there was an idea of having a handbook that would help historians, local historians do their work. And at, that, at those several meetings, what it transformed into is saying that a physical handbook is great, but really what people need is something that is really freely accessible. So wherever you are, if you have access to the internet, and also as there had been more discussion about what does it mean to go beyond simply diversity, but trying to be a more inclusive historian, that is trying to provide equity in interpretation. And that is some of the main ideas that drove this. So it is, we really thank our sponsors, the National Council on Public History and the American Association of State and Local History that have been able to, pre, to basically provide the platform to have a free resource. And so when you have time, um, please click on that link or look up Inclusive Historian. And what you'll find is that there are entries that have been, um, there are inter various es short essays um, about topics that may be of interest to local historians. So some of them are very specific to, um, to issues that um, you really encounter when you're doing local history. And others might be providing some background. Let's say that you're trying to provide a new exhibit on the Civil War or on the US founders. So what this, these were conceptualized is that you might be able to read this, find links to other resources, and really get you thinking, kind of provide a direction of if you're not quite sure what it means that you desire to do things that are more inclusive, but not quite sure how to go at it, this would provide a resource. So the entries were not something that, Je that Bob, Will, and I just kind of dreamed up on, uh, on our own. And Will, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Um, we have a fairly large advisory committee, a large and I would say active advisory committee. And they are range from people who are active involved in um, local history, who teach public history, who are working themselves right now as interpreters. And like many public historians, they've gone through, like myself and probably everyone here, they've gone through many different iterations of their career. And so what we've asked people to do is to put themselves in the position of users and dream up what they would like to, some of the ideas they would like. What happens next is that the editors um, work, try to use those networks and suggestions to find people who will write a short essay. And then um, once we get that, we post that on the website. Okay. So I'll go to the next slide. <laughs> okay. okay. So working with that advisory committee and other public historians, uh, municipal historians, local historians, uh, we were able to generate a list of goals that would sort of focus the project, sort of keep us uh, centered as we tried to create this resource that would be useful. And we came up with these four goals. First of all, we hope uh, to share a knowledge base that invites more people to engage in history projects. So, so really thinking about how we could get people excited about history and as Madupe said, give them sort of some of the resources or an entry point to, to learn more, to know how to maybe execute some of the, the things that they imagine. Um, second, we, the, the handbook really centers equity, inclusivity, diversity, and public service. So uh, it, it, it's very broad. It touches on many aspects of public history work, public historians work, uh, but in every entry, you will have discussion of these issues, equity, inclusivity, diversity, and public service. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there were concrete examples uh, not extended case studies, but we wanted to give people uh, a sense that there were historic sites, museums, public historians out there who were doing this work um, and have had some success. Maybe not perfect, you know, everybody has room for improvement, but these are things that could be inspiring or uh, potentially provide a model 
for uh, public historians who are trying to be more inclusive. So we wanted to make sure that those, there were those concrete examples, links that you could click through uh, to, uh, to the sites or to resource guides, uh, to support networks, all those kinds of things. And then finally, we hope that we could provide uh, accessible windows into the many ways public historians work. So to, to really cast our net broadly, look at the field and uh, try to give readers a sense of, of all that's going on, the many, many different ways that public historians, not just in, in colleges or universities or uh, in big museums, but all across the country uh, and indeed beyond the United States are, uh, are working to, to bring history to their communities, to do history with, with uh, their communities, to collaborate and uh, to really, uh, to, to build a past that can inform the present. Okay, let's talk about audience. And um, in a nutshell, our audience is, um, is very broad. It includes um, virtually everybody who practices history. Um, this includes, as you can see, uh, community historians and educators, museum professionals, etc. And of course, this means that you, everyone listening here, is uh, a member of our intended audience. Um, and so perhaps uh, indirectly are your audiences that you talk to in each of your community. Um, so um, no matter how many degrees um, people have, uh, our feeling is that everybody understands history one way or another and that um, inclusive historians don't just teach the many diverse uh, people in our communities, uh, we also learn from our audiences. Um, if this sounds simple, it's not. Um, in my mind, there's a character in, uh, in Philip Caputo's, uh, uh, Philip Caputo novel who describes community work uh, this way. He said, the secret to working with people is that you bring yourself to them and become one with them without ever, ever forgetting who and what you really are. And Caputo called this a bit of a high wire act. Let me give you um, an example of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, back in the 1990s, there was a controversy in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania uh, about the changing uh, of the name of one of the city's main streets, uh, Market Street, to Martin Luther King Boulevard. This was a good idea because uh, Harrisburg's population was uh, about 50% African-American and people who had lived there for a long time uh, and everyone knew either indirectly through uh, their families and friends that Harrisburg's black community was uh, important from the 1780s uh, when Harrisburg was founded uh, through its history with the Underground Railroad and the Civil War through the Jim Crow era up through the uh, um, civil rights era, uh, Harrisburgers had contributed uh, to American history and distinguished themselves in uh, business, the arts, education, etc. cetera. Uh, and no one outside the community seemed to know or care about any of this. So uh, it seemed to uh, Harrisburgers that one way to share this um, history was to name one of the streets after one of the nation's most iconic history makers and um, uh, that was fine except uh, there were many uh, people outside the community who weren't interested in hearing this history um, and don't be shocked um, they weren't always polite in expressing their uh, opinions and then things got really interesting uh, there were some people in the african-american community who um, began claiming that the naming of market street dated back to when it was the, uh, the site of the city's slave market. Um, and um, that was a problem um, because um, there were a lot of people who just weren't prepared to uh, hear this. But let's say you are a historian working in Harrisburg and, and you're um, say, um, 
an Irishman or an Italian or maybe even an African American yourself, and you've been trained in history, uh, you've been working with residents of the, of the city's uh, neighborhoods, and you want to help people, all people, come to a better understanding of American history, and that would be one that works for every, everybody. Um, so you go to the archives and you uh, read some books, and at some point you're faced with the fact that there's absolutely no record of the Harrisburg slave market. Uh, not only that, your research shows that Pennsylvania became the first state in the country to uh, abolish slavery when it passed the gradual uh, emancipation law in 1780. Um, that was five years before Harrisburg became an incorporated town and laid out Market Street and other town roads. In other words, um, there was no slave market in Harrisburg. So that presents uh, us with, uh, uh, as inclusive historians, a question of um, what do you do now? How do you present this dilemma to the public? And um, think about that and uh, think about it as we go through uh, the rest of the program because we're gonna be addressing questions like this and hopefully we'll give you some answers. So on to the next slide. Okay, so th there are lots of uh, case studies, as I mentioned, and perhaps some that are challenging, present challenging quandaries like that. Um, other cases where sites chose to kind of take a stand and make their work uh, directly relevant uh, to uh, the, the challenges that their communities were facing in that in the present moment. Um, so we're going to give you a brief tour of the website. Uh, we tried to keep it as simple as we possibly could. Uh, we didn't want to have it, you know, be look like a uh, an edited collection of academic essays. We wanted it to be sort of simple and clean and easy to navigate. So this is what you see when you come to the uh, homepage, inclusivehistorian.com. You can click right here, read entries, and that will take you right into an alphabetical list of entries. Uh, this is a living source. We're adding con content to it uh, as we speak. Uh, at least over the next year or two, we'll be adding more content. So you'll see recent entries when they're loaded that they will appear on the home page. Um, if you want to contact us, you can click here. That will go through to uh, a general email uh, for, uh, for the handbook. And this is really the heart of the website. It's, it's simple. As I said, we, did, we didn't want there to be a real barrier or kind of intimidation factor. Uh, when you come into this, list of entries. It's just an alphabetical list of a single word or a phrase. Uh, and hopefully, you know, somebody who maybe doesn't have any background or training, but, you know, wants to get resources, we can come to this and say, hey, you know, I do want to know more about accessibility. Or, you know, I'm, I'm interested in food. Let me, let me dig into food history. Maybe there's something here, you know, uh, for me. Uh, so this right now we've got uh, I think about 20, 26 entries. We're we're, we're aiming high. We'll see what uh, number we eventually get to. Um, but you can see there's quite a range of topics already, uh, and it's a mixture of some things that are you know topical or content based in terms of a, a historical era or historical topic, and then also uh, uh, more conceptual looking, for example, at, uh, at diversity inclusion or collaborative practice. Wanted to also call your attention to the key resources page. Uh, it became clear in developing the site and uh, going through the process of creating the entries that we needed to have a single hub for important resources that kept coming back, you know, that a lot of people were referring to. Um, so this is a place where we, we've collected, you, you may find some of these uh, linked within the entries, but uh, this is a place where you can go to just to check out, hey, you know, maybe there's a, uh, a good organization that's already doing work that's related to what I'm interested in. Maybe there's an organization that's been doing it for 100 years. 
right? And I'm not aware of that. So let me let me go here and, and see if there there might be some resources that would help me. <clears throat> if you want to learn a little bit more about kind of the background, the philosophy, um, some suggestions for how to use the handbook, things we're going to talk about. Uh, these are all on the about page, uh, how to propose an entry, and then also the editors and the advisory committee. So that's that's a real brief tour. We're going to actually take you into some, uh, some specific entries uh, in a little bit. Uh, so I won't spend too much time with that, but uh, this is when you come in to an entry, this is what you'll see. As Madupe said, these are, these are short, readable, um, and not written in, in jargon, but really supposed to provide uh, good accessible information um, for all users. All right. I'm going to speak a little bit about non-inclusive practices. We often are constantly within the session, we're speaking about how we want to do inclusive history. And what does that look like? What does that mean? And um, of course, this handbook provides many examples of what inclusive history looks like. And there, and there are several examples that are continuously growing. Less often um, do we talk about and identify non-inclusive practices, attitudes, and behaviors. So I want to share just a, a few. There are a handful that are listed here on the slide, um, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about the first one that's listed talks about encountering a specific community for the first time only with the specific purpose of doing a project. So to that I say, as you enter, some of you all are entering new roles or just within your roles um, as, as town historians or working in museums or other cultural sites, it's always important to connect with all groups or as many as possible within your community to build that rapport, to build that trust, so that when you are prepared to do a project, you already kind of know some of the players and some of the people that represent certain communities and have certain bits of knowledge that will be helpful. Connected to that first point is also, after you meet all these fine people and you find out what they know and um, you're ready to do this project, you want to make sure that you include all relevant voices in some capacity. So um, the other piece is another non-inclusive practice is to attempt to tell a history of a specific group without including those individuals. So I just encourage you all to, to seek roles and positions for, for people whose narratives or groups of whose narratives you are representing. That could be an advisory group capacity, um, if you're writing a grant and there's room to write in a consultant, if that, if that makes sense, do things like that, as well as have them be engaged as active participants in any kind of programming or focus groups, things of that nature. Um, the last one that I want to talk about is still connected as it relates to the failure to give credit or acknowledgement. So once again, after you meet all these people, you, you're in your role, you meet lots of people and there's lots of information that you may absorb. And um, as you begin to prepare programs, exhibitions, write articles, publish books, always, always make sure that you include and, and give credit where credit is due to those who have supported the work. So with that, I just wanna, wanna um, just really challenge all of us as historians Many of these things are not intentional. Some of them might be intentional. You have to really be courageous and look within yourself and see what things might make you uncomfortable, certain groups that, that you're just not familiar with. We really have to push boundaries and make sure that we tell the complete story and tell inclusive stories by first identifying what propensities we might have towards non-inclusive practices. So um, one of the things that, um, that you may have noticed from what Kimberly just noted is that um, that inclusive practice is often very collaborative. 
one of the things that I was told um, as a student in history classes that is a complete lie is that historians do their work individually and then they just simply give it to other people. Even the historians, the academic historians that I admire the most that are in the ivoriest of most ivory of ivory towers do not do their work in, on their own. They work, high, they work in collaboration. That collaboration often includes archivists. It includes people who hold local history. And as public historians, it's even more important to get your, to kind of get the orientation that you are part of a community of people who care about the past and care about the present. So you won't look at the, in the Inclusive Historian's Handbook, there won't be a how to be inclusive kind of entry, but what you'll see is kind of an orientation about how to think about sources, how to think about trends and apply that in other, in, in any given situation you're in. So you may have been thinking when you heard Kimberly set talking saying, gee, that takes a lot of time. It, is, it does take a lot of time. It does take more time to um, talk to a librarian and ask the librarian, What's, you know, what do you have around foodways in my town? You know, I know about this, I know about that. The librarian might actually tell you, you need to talk to this person, you know, Mr. and Ms. thus and such um, who run this bakery and you need to talk to these people who've just established this great taqueria. That's what we're talking about inclusive work. So um, you might, for example, you might read the book about, you might read the entry about foodways and then you indicate, you think about like, I'm gonna take some time and look at this before I do my project. So there's no shortcut. Um, you will make mistakes. I've made, made, if we were in a different kind of session, I'd be telling you about all the mistakes I've made but I think one of the things is to operate out of the idea of trust and goodwill. And, um, and that a lot of times if you've been in part of any community, I don't matter, it doesn't matter how big or how small, um, word of mouth travels really well. And so if you're known as somebody who follows up, who asks questions, who treats people with respect, that will go a long way. You can't control everything. But it makes a huge difference to say if you're going, if you're thinking about creating a plaque to commemorate um, the past in a certain area. I used to work on roadside markers. That's how I first got to know Bob. Is we actually in Colorado? We actually, when I was doing that work, we actually started asking people in the community, "What is it that you think is important?" Some of that was work that we think was um, we thought that's a great story. Others think like we have certain issue parameters, but I think this is the process of being open that you have certain expertise, but it doesn't mean that you are the only person who is involved in interpretation. So um, I would encourage people to be kind of something I learned when I was teaching and it felt initially pretty um, corny or awkward was putting time to um, say like, how am I going to ask for help? kind of mapping it out instead of just saying, kind of going by the seat of your pants, um, asking people, what do you think I did well? What do you think that could have gone better? This feels really hard, but the more you do it, the more you will, um, the easier it gets. And I think the other issue is um, thinking about all of the aspects of how you do this history is around equity. So the inclusive aspect is actually a process. And so um, in the next slide, I just had a definition of equity. There's lots of, there's lots of different processes, uh, definitions, but one of them, it says here to treat everyone fairly. And this is deeply rooted in the idea of justice, but it also means acknowledging that there has been injustice in the past. So at the um, historic marker program I worked on, my predecessor realized that almost all the historic markers in Colorado from the 1920s to 1990s, I don't think any of them talked about a real woman. Almost none of them talk about native people. They didn't talk about um, 
they didn't talk about local history at all. I mean, it was like basically a real, some big person nationally came here. That's why it's important. So what that meant when they, we were redoing the historical markers was not saying we're gonna do more markers about when President Roosevelt came to Colorado and shot animals. We're actually going to be looking at what it meant for women to get suffrage, what it meant for um, people to settle in an area and actually looking at conflict. Um, so this means that your, your basic ideas isn't just kind of superficial but you're thinking about how your actions now relates to the past and the future that you would like. So that's kind of thinking, that might be a useful way to think about equity. So I'll leave it to the next person now. And that would be me. Uh, we're gonna to wanna to talk a little bit about different ways you can use the handbook. Um, and going right down the list here, um, you see we want people to um, use the, this site uh, to reflect on history themselves. Um, now, presumably, um, anyone who's on the site has an interest in inclusiveness, and, uh, and it's kind of a self-selecting group we're dealing with, but uh, it would be a, an opportunity for everybody, no matter what level of experience you might have, um, to go through this. You, you, there's always opportunities to uh, uh, be open and learn a little bit more um, it's also a good opportunity to share it with others because there are other people who um, may not have considered um, all of the uh, um, implications of what it means to um, work with more diverse audiences and include everybody in their conversations. Um, clearly, there are um, opportunities here to use the site to help um, develop um, team building. Um, I think as Madupi said, um, it is critical in any project, any public project, uh, to spend time um, building trust and goodwill among uh, the participants in your group because um, if there weren't, there would be no need for the site. Um, um, people need to get used to working with each other and um, that takes time. So this, uh, we think that uh, the handbook can be helpful in that regard because you can get people onto the uh, same page, um, whether um, your project is a historical marker or a, uh, an exhibit you're developing with your local historical society or, or whatever. Um, as far as uh, teaching and mentoring go, many of the people who um, teach um, might want to use this site as well. And I don't know if there are a lot of people teaching here uh, with Afanese, but uh, undoubtedly there are. Uh, and the, um, the handbook is, is made for use in, in the classroom. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an opportunity to uh, get students and interns thinking about uh, the various issues that are on the table. Um, so um, uh, as far as collaboration and partnerships are concerned, um, again, um, any project you do um, is a group project. That's what distinguishes public history from maybe many, many kinds of academic his history, especially um, long ago. I mean, Madupi has made the point, I think, uh, appropriately that even that today academics tend not to be as isolated as they once were. Um, I'm old, so I can remember days when uh, it wasn't always that way. Um, I'm a historic artifact in that sense, I guess. Um, but with collaborations, um, be sure that if you're, <laughs> that you've got a, a full mix of people in your group, in your partnership, um, it would be uh, a, a women's history project that consists only of women is going to be um, maybe not as uh, um, um, full of discussion as one that includes some men, even some people who have different opinions, um, which is uh, which is sometimes difficult, but uh, it might might help you sort out problems before you go public with them. Um, 
if you're writing grants um, today and presumably in the future, um, you better be uh, up to speed on dealing with diversity and inclusiveness or your grant may not be as successful as it might otherwise be. Um, and on all those stories, we have um, great bibliographies um, throughout, and you can do, you can mine the site for resources um, for as long as you like. Um, and um, I would also say that um, as you go through the, the stories, you might think of um, topics for other stories and that perhaps ones that you might even be um, qualified to or interested in writing um, contribute. We're open to that. We're, we're always open to new ideas and um, we hope to hear from, um, from all of you or many of you in the future with your, uh, your thoughts. So. So we want to give you some examples now. We're going to highlight three different entries, kind of walk you through them, uh, some of the key points and, uh, and some of the resources that uh, the authors have shared. So I am up next, everybody, and I am pleased and excited to present to you the first article we're going to walk through is on heritage tourism and it's brought to you by one of your colleagues in New York State, Cordell Reeves, who is an historic interpretation and preservation analyst at the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. So as um, Bob was talking about some of the ways in which this handbook can be used, most certainly look for colleagues there and people that you can network with. So he is certainly a great one. So within this um, particular article, there are some wonderful gems and it's separated um, through various sections. The first being about being a constant ambassador for the site. Um, what I really appreciated about that section was really the inclusion of the staff, everybody from the security officer, uh, from the curator, from the person who's sweeping the front steps. They need to be an ambassador for the site and really understand that the, the present day visitor is, is supremely important. So also as historians in whatever role we're doing, um, we sometimes get bogged down in, in collections management, you know, with the collections or advertising for the site and all of those things are important. But um, what Cordell speaks about is really making sure that everything that we do is in service to the public. Um, the second piece he talks about is balancing stewardship and visitor experience. And um, again, he's talking about the current visitor experience as well. So that's, that's actually the piece that I described first. He's really talking about making sure the visitor experience is central. Um, included in that is everything we've been talking about, about paying attention to the surroundings. Communities sometimes change as well. And we need to make sure that the visitor experience truly reflects the community that it serves. Another piece is telling complete stories is good business. So this was very interesting to me um, as it spoke about this hero narrative and how the hero narrative often excludes indigenous people, people of African descent, people within the LGBTQ community, women across cultural, um, you know, dis, uh, cultural backgrounds and also individuals from diverse, both ethnic and class um, origins. So it really talks about doing in depth and diverse resource diving really beyond the written archive as well, because um, many times archives are biased and there's not really the full record that's represented in some of the archives where we do research. So Cordell even talks about examples of using archeology span and even West African cosmology and digging deeper to unearth stories that may have been neglected previously or ignored. Um, the other things that we've already been talking about is how diverse audiences matter and how we need to do things in the site to, to attract and engage. And that, again, talks about that hard work that Madupe talks about, about collaborating and really understanding who you're serving and what the stories are that matter to the community. Um, connecting with tourism professionals 
ultimately important networking 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 is so so important which is what we're doing here in a virtual sense but uh cordell speaks about it in the way that when you meet with tourism professionals not just in your state but outside of the state and in other spaces it will often expand your perspective to help you push and move forward and really um, do something different at your site um, the final piece is about investment and return and we talk about all this work is hard and and you're not going to quadruple visitors <laughs> overnight it's not going to happen so um, but surely when you put in this work and really push through um, you will see the return in the end. So again, this is our first example from Coral Reeves right there in the state. And it just shows how there are lots of wonderful nuggets in those short pieces within this handbook. U.S. Founders. Um, the author here is Marla Miller, um, who, is, who teaches history at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She's practically a New Yorker. She's right over the line. Um, she's also the current president of um, the National Council on Public History and the author of a biography of Betsy Ross and very qualified to address the topic of the U.S. founders. Uh, I recall when we were in Hartford and we, we um, um, introduced the project to a, um, an audience of people who, for the first time, uh, and there were people in the audience who, who we asked them what they wanted to um, read about, and one person said, well, I'm really not interested in George Washington and stuff like that. I'm interested in uh, topics that matter today. Well, I, I think if you go through Mar Marla's uh, article, you find out that this is a topic that does indeed um, resonate with today's audiences and today's topics. Um, it's interesting uh, in her background that um, the topic of the founding fathers first came up, was introduced by Warren Harding, which um, imagine that. Harding did something other than um, die in office, um, which is good. Um, but um, Marla makes the point that uh, founding fathers doesn't quite work uh, today, considering that there were uh, at least uh, as many founding mothers. Um, so U.S. founders is the uh, is the term that we'd like to use. Um, and she uh, also makes the point that for the past 40 years, scholars especially, and, and other historians, museum historians, have been uh, developing um, critical perspectives on the revolutionary era that uh, uh, uncover stories about um, white, black, and Native Americans, um, as well as women. Um, and um, much of that research has made its way into, uh, into museum exhibits um, and, uh, and other public programs. Uh, and when we get into expanding the uh, meaning of the founders, Marla spends some time talking about the uh, Philadelphia experience uh, of uh, dealing with um, the development of the president's house and the uh, pavilion that houses the, the um, Liberty Bell. Um, and for those of you who may be unfamiliar with this, this was, uh, this was um, a pretty rocky time. It was uh, uh, the... Uh, the Park Service discovered that they uh, have a larger audience than they once did and um, learned a lot about uh, collaboration and diversity and inclusiveness themselves and Marla talks about that. She also goes over some of the uh, um, history that's been written, especially about African Americans uh, dating back to 1855 and working up through um, some of the more recent stuff. Um, slavery, in fact, has been um, a topic in which um, the founders are um, uh, certainly uh, involved. I think we're all familiar with the fact that um, the Constitution, when it was first written, was a, um, a groundbreaking doc uh, document in many respects, but um, it, um, it allowed for slavery and there's a Uh-oh. We lost your audio, Bob. I'm not sure what happened, Bob. 
Does anybody else hear his audio? No, he cut out. Okay. Check your connections, Bob. Maybe something pulled loose. Can we give him a phone number to call in? Yeah, we're pretty close here to the end. We've lost your audio. We can still see you, Bob. You want me to pick up Marla's entry? Okay. Okay, so Bob was talking about, uh, you know, Marla engages with the current literature and also the ways in which uh, a number of museums have uh, started to address uh, the issue of slavery and the founding and the, and the founders. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the issue of slavery opens up other conversations around race and uh, you know other issues that uh, are relevant you know still in our uh, current society uh, and there are sites uh, that address the revolutionary era that uh, have tried to kind of make those connections more explicit not just around slavery but around a variety of issues for example the old south meeting house in boston uses its space to talk about free speech right the history of free speech um, and Lincoln's Cottage. Uh, similarly, you know, a little outside the founding, but, you know, the revolutionary principles are important to Lincoln uh, and his rhetoric, uh, his ideas, and so they're, they're, they make connections there as well to sort of contemporary current issues. Um, Marlowe also gives some uh, suggestions about how to uh, make it make your institution, if you're working within an institutional context, more inclusive, you know, a historic house or a museum, um, and how to engage in inclusive interpretation, which is something that we can all do as public historians, think about the language that we use. Uh, a simple thing uh, she mentions is a, a, a more inclusive family language. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we, we shouldn't make assumptions about uh, the groups that we're speaking with, uh, especially if they're young people or family groups, um, that, they, that they might look a certain way. Um, so the, the language that we could use can modulate, could be modulated a little bit. And uh, that actually is appropriate for the 18th century, because in the 18th century, you often had uh, very mixed, extended uh, family groups living uh, under one roof. Uh, so the, our sort of 21st century idea of family or a 20th century idea of family uh, is not the same as an 18th century idea of family. Uh, she does a similar thing with thinking about language around ability, right? Uh, how might... Uh, founders think of George Washington and what what he experienced with his teeth, for example. You know the, how might how you might be able to make a connection with a contemporary visitor around ideas of ability or disability. Uh, so there are a lot of ways just to make simple changes, uh, even in just the language that we use when we talk about history, uh, to to make it more <clears throat> inclusive. Are you back, Bob? I might be. Hey, yes. all right, good. How did I do that? I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so the last entry we wanted to highlight for you all is uh, an entry on historic house museums. We know that uh, many town historians, municipal historians do work with historic house museums, whether it's your local historical society or a museum in your town. Uh, so it's worth uh, thinking about you know, some of the issues that historic houses are uh, facing. Uh, I've spent a lot of time myself working in various historic houses. My first uh, museum job was at Sagamore Hill, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's house in my hometown, Oyster Bay. I worked at the Paul Revere House in Boston. Uh, so this is a topic uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, but uh, many historic house museums have struggled with uh, how to make their, their stories relevant, how to make them inclusive. Many historic houses of the past focused on the furniture or on uh, sort of locally prominent individuals who maybe don't resonate as much with audiences anymore. So historic house museums are trying to think about ways that they, they can be relevant uh, and uh, address uh, histories that, uh, that speak to their current uh, audiences and current communities. 
Uh, one of the nice things about the authors here, uh, Nina Zanari is the uh, president of the Paul Revere House, um, executive director, and Ken Torino uh, is a long time uh, staff person with Historic New England, it's a, uh, an umbrella organization that works with many uh, historic sites uh, throughout New England. And uh, what, what they do is they really focus on opportunities, right? That, that historic houses are these wonderfully rich sites for doing history, inclusive history. And so let's think about, you know, what, what are the opportunities that we have here uh, for doing this work rather than sort of dwelling on the, the problems or the drawbacks. Um, and uh, they again give some models, some examples uh, that we could uh, look to. Uh, places that are doing some good work, like the Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Hartford, Connecticut, um, is using its uh, site collection, the story of Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin, to uh, to inspire conversations around uh, race and other uh, contemporary issues. Um, but uh, I wanted to draw your attention just to some of the strategies that they uh, they suggest. Um, first of all consider all the residents and consider the issues, right? So inclusive history sometimes means just looking beyond the narrow stories of prominent people that have been told again and again and again, right? In the case of the Paul Revere house, many, many people lived in that house for over, over almost four centuries. It was built in 1680 and people lived there up until the early 20th century. So, you know, the, there are a lot of people who were, um, who went past through that house. So could we talk about some of them, you know, not just Paul Revere. Uh, involve your stakeholders and your community. So these are what we've sort of been talking consistently about through this whole presentation, those relationships that you build, uh, that trust that you build. Um, and trying to avoid some of those non-inclusive practices and, and, and do some of the things that Madupe was talking about in terms of um, building trust, listening, asking for help, and accepting help. Uh, cultivate meaningful partnerships. So, you know, it, it, we're all busy. It, sometimes it could be hard to maintain those relationships, those partnerships, but the, the strongest ones are the, the relationships, the partnerships that build over time. Um, you might want to develop a memorandum of understanding or agreement with your partner to say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I sort of expect you're going to do. And you, you agree on that. And then hopefully you're able to fulfill that obligation. And, and then research back to what we do as historians, right? The research is, is really important. And, and the more we dig into this and the more we get beyond just what has always been told, um, we find that, hey, you know what? There is evidence of all these other stories. And, and it's here in the documents or it's in oral histories. Um, uh, we, just, we just never looked for it the right way in the past. So, so you know, there's plenty of room for more good historical research here. Again, seek assist assistance. We've already talked about this. Nobody knows everything, especially when you're doing this kind of collaborative work. Um, there are resources out there, and that's one of the reasons, one of the things we're hoping to provide with the handbook is a, a gateway to some of those resources. Uh, build staff and board buy-in. Everybody has got to, this is more from an institutional standpoint, but if you're working with a local historical society, you might need to kind of sell these, some of these ideas to a board. You might need to get the volunteers to understand why it's a good idea. You know, so you, you as the town historian or municipal historian, you, you, can, you can do that work. Okay. All right, well, I think we've just about come to the end of our time, right, uh, right on time. Um, so uh, now it's uh, your opportunity to ask questions. Uh, there may have been questions typed in the chat already that I haven't seen, but uh, we'd like to ask you to share your questions in the chat and uh, then I will, I'll read them uh, for the panel and, uh, and we can respond. Thank you.
it's just scrolling down to the bottom here. Okay, so we've got a question right at the bottom. Um, how do you handle a community that may not want diversity? So I'll start is that one aspect is that diversity is actually part of the United States, that there isn't a non-diverse community, how that, and some of it may be thinking about how your role is, works within the community. So part of it may be just kind of illustrating that, that initial aspect. Um, so that whether you're talking about U.S. settlement, what New York looked like when, um, you know, amongst the, the actual sometimes antagonism amongst European settlers, what religion looked like. So I think some of the aspect of when people assert we don't have diversity and we don't want diversity is often a sometimes, sometimes deliberate, sometimes unintentional misreading of their own past and sometimes looking at the past in ways that might seem, I mean, I, I'm not underestimating how difficult this is, is to kind of open like, let's talk about how religion has worked. Let's talk about what in what indigenous European um, settler relationships looked like. Um, that might be one area, but that's, that's how, you know, it's hard. Jason, you're putting for the big issue and um, we don't have all the bad, like your situation has very probably very specific example suggestions, but I'll just kind of leave it to some of my other colleagues here. Um, I would say that uh, it's hard to find a, a, a community that isn't diverse. So I'm not sure, I, I, I might rephrase the question to, to say instead of, um, what if you have a community that doesn't want diversity? What you're really saying is, what if you have a community with a lot of people in it who don't want diversity? Um, and to, and that's a, that's an issue we deal with all the time. And I'll go back to what Madupe had said earlier. Um, you've got to spend time with people. You've got to build trust. You've got to let uh, people share uh, share their opinions, no matter how um, much you disagree with them. And you got to work through them. It's um, it gets back to that high wire act I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, it's not easy, um, but you have to um, be determined to get it across because you're doing the right thing. Uh, inclusive history is good history. And as a professional, your responsibility is to do the best kind of history you can. And that includes getting as many different um, opinions together, points of view together. But you as a historian, in the end, are going to have to um, edit that community's um, thinking. You're the, you're the one as the historian who, who writes that final text for that historical marker, for example. Um, be determined. Do the right, read, the, read through the uh, manual read, and do the right thing. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that uh, I agree. This is the right thing, but at, this, at the same time, we shouldn't underestimate the uh, the fact that there is an audience for this history, you know, and there's a hunger for it and a desire for it. So I, I think sometimes we might self censor a little bit, not to downplay the issues that we all face, but uh, sometimes we may say self censor because we think, uh, well, they're not my community or mem members of my community. Uh, might not want this, might not want to hear this. Um, but what, uh, what a lot of people have found in the, in the history field, public history and museum field, is that when they start telling these stories, people come out of the woodwork, you know, that they, they um, uh, are excited about, about the stories uh, in ways that, uh, that you might not expect. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, your, your community is engaged with history in ways that they haven't been in, in 50 years or 75 years. Uh, so I, I hear you and I, I can kind of imagine the subtext uh, behind the question, uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, this, this 
there's a lot of opportunity out there. And that's, I think, what, what Nina Zanari and Ken Carino were kind of trying to emphasize uh, that, uh, we, you know, we can, this is exciting, uh, to, an exciting opportunity to, to do some, some interesting history that will, you know, connect with people. Um, just to jump in quickly, Diane, you just sent something to me privately. I don't know if you had wanted to share that with everybody, but it just came to me. I'm sorry, I'm suddenly not able to type in the chat. <laughs> not sure why, but I just wanted to put that out there to Diane if you had wanted to share that more broadly. I oh, think. Yes. Oh yes, go I ahead. Think I, I think I see it. Is this the one my community has specifically asked me not to talk about COVID, Native American history, African American history, and U.S. history before 1492? So I guess my follow-up question there I'll ask is, who, who, who do you mean by your community? Did we lose you, Diane? Or are you typing it? Diane, you can feel free to unmute and, and talk at this point if you would like as well. Yes, uh, I have a Facebook page. I am the Elmira City Historian and we have topics that sometimes get a little heated down here. And I have been called every name in the book and I have to hold myself together sometimes because these people are ruthless. So what you were specifically talking about is kind of managing these conversations on social yes. media. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <sighs> Anybody want to take that? <laughs> I let it go as far as I can, and then I start cutting people off. But right. I really want to keep the topic alive, and I want to talk about COVID, and I want to talk about Black Lives Matter. And they feel that I'm pushing too hard, I guess. But. Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll say something. I mean, um, it's really been stated before. I use the word courage, you know, um, it's, it's, we have, a, and, and, and kudos to you, you know, for, for holding strong. But mm -hmm. I really believe as, as historians, we have a responsibility, you know, to uphold um, these narratives mm -hmm. and, and tell these inclusive stories. And, you know, all these things that you have noted are all facts <laughs> that that people don't want you to, to share about so I think still just maintaining in your role setting setting the standard and the precedence of how you will go about telling stories and that's that's what it mm -hmm. is and it, again it's not easy so I don't I don't really have like advice other than that than setting the standard this is what we're going to do um, tell these stories and give space to these narratives. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, and it's not easy. No, no, it's not. The other thing that I would add is, I think it's twofold. Um, I think social media right now, tragically, is becoming an extraordinarily toxic place. So I think it's really important that you take care of yourself and whoever, you know, that's a, that has often been um, kind of, kind of almost come out like self-care is like, you know, let's go to a spa, but it, it can get really in your head yes, it does. And, yes, it and, does. It, and it can really hurt. Yeah. So if you want, I mean, I would, I, what the advantage of social media though, is you can get things out there. And so I would encourage you to think and maybe strategize with some trusted people about how to communicate in a way that might actually unfortunately minimize the response, but that that you can use your tools as a historian, you, which I think is like, like one of the things that I found really profound that I've learned from mentors is put the material out there. Mm -hmm. um, say, here are citations, here's my scanned material. This is how it's being interpreted. Unfortunately, we could not communicate via Facebook or whatever it is right now because it's so we're not actually having a discussion, but I still feel it, that, you know, you might say that, you know, really kind of, kind of get some friends, allies, fellow people oh, maybe yeah. in this discussion, in this community to help out, to think about how to, 
to strategize. I mean, that, um, and I did just see Mary Ellen saying the Facebook, like face, for whatever reason, people are extraordinarily reactive. You yes, might be does. talking about beautiful gladiolas and people will come mm -hmm. back at you about how, how hybrid crops are the worst things in the world. And I'm really, I mean, so I really think that um, trying not to add to it and trying not to troll. Now, I mean, but I think um, share with your colleagues about it because I do think the other side of it is Facebook groups have been profoundly important for communicating local history. Yes, yes. Excuse me, I, I don't know how to chat, but I have something to add. <laughs> uh, uh, in my t I did, did a recent article in our local newspaper about uh, slavery in our town. And uh, it caused quite a bit of conversation in town. And it was good uh, because I think people didn't realize that we, uh, we practice slavery. Uh, this is a big sub suburb of Albany. And I think it, it raised awareness. And uh, some people said, well, he's, he's uh, fanning the flames because of course I, I did this because of the Black Lives Matter. Yeah. But other people came to, my, came to my defense. And you know, I, I just think it's great to make people aware of these things. Thank you. Yeah. Can I say something uh, about the, there was a question earlier about lore and about a, a cross burning there. Yes. I mean, I think it's quite a part. There is no written, but lore recross burning in our community. I would like to share this lore. Can I? Joan, I unmute that, yourself and, and ask the question so you can kind of clarify it. Mm -hmm. There were two, there were two, um, instances of cross burning. Um, one back in the Ku Klux Klan days, and the cross burning in our community was for Catholics um, because there had never been any Catholics that lived here. Um, and the other one was um, recent history. In the 1970s, there was a family that had a fresh air, fresh air person from the city. And a cross was burned on their their land. Now, neighbors came. Neighbors came before they even saw it and put it out. Um, so the child never saw it, but it happened. I would like to make that a part of, it was never written down. It certainly wasn't part of any, we have no local police force. Um, so I, I would like to share that. I, all I have is just stories. You know, can I, can I jump in here? Just, I, I don't have an answer to it, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, I've heard from many people who have had similar experiences. I've had similar experiences where you start talking about the Klan in upstate New York and somebody shares a story with you about how, oh, my family member, you know, it, it, it honestly happened with me with a student. They said, you know, somebody in my family told me about this and they have the stuff. You know, I mean, they had the pamphlet and brought it. So, you know, this is a big part of the history and it's, it's rarely talked about. I know Bob uh, put a, a Klan robe from Buffalo or Rochester in, uh, his, in his Civil War exhibit. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, these stories are really present. You know, I, I think there's a lot of memory uh, of the Klan and, and it's not gone away, you know, that, that, uh, you know, you have this flyers and things that have been distributed, I, you know, in, in the past few years, if not right now. Uh, there were, New York, unfortunately, has a, um, a, uh, a long history with the Klan. There were about a quarter of a million New Yorkers who were Klan members during the 1920s. So chances are, uh, if you're in upstate New York, especially, or Long Island, um, chances are your community has some Klan connections. Um, I'd be surprised if they didn't. And I think it's probably a good thing to raise awareness of just um, not only the Klan's um, activities themselves, but also the response. Al Smith himself was, uh, 
um, a very prominent uh, opponent of the Klan, uh, and ultimately um, the good guys won. Yeah, it caused, it caused quite a stir in our town when I published a 1920 photograph of the Klan uh, complete in their robes marching in a 4th of July parade here in town. Again, a lot of discussion. Um, I would also say, Joni, is that um, I just said I agree with uh, Susan's suggestion about recording oral histories. I think if you are going to publicize this, I think one of the really important things is to talk about historical memory and to talk about why such such incidents might not make the news. So I think there's sometimes people have a really kind of straightforward idea, like if something happened, therefore it will be printed. I think it's useful to put the context that we use newspapers all the time doing local history, but we don't assume that everything in it was a kind of neutral discussion about what was happening in the area. Um, also, but really kind of talking about these as um, kind of a terrorist, especially I'm just thinking about the um, fresh air, like when you talk about the, the 1970s. Um, there's a lot of material out there, whether it's from uh, B'nai B'rith or others about how um, people adopted Klan images, like having a Ku Klux, burning a Ku Klux Klan, burning a cross doesn't necessarily mean that people are, are Klan members, but it does mean they're white supremacists or that they want to terrorize people. You know, so the, these hate images get kind of widespread. And um, that something that, um, that might seem as benign as the Fresh Air Fund means that um, there's, the, the fact that there's this story shows that there were at least some people who were deeply invested in not even allowing a, a child presumably a black or brown child to have a short term time in upstate New York. Maybe, you know, don't be afraid to unpack it to do a little bit of interpretation about what that story even means, you know? So, um, you know, good luck. And I think that, um, I think that context will, will help like saying the 1970s, I grew up in Iowa in the 1970s. There were a lot of, there were a lot of cross burnings. And, um, and it was one of the upri uprisings of the kind of fragmentation of the Klan after the 1960s. Um, but there were a lot of hate groups and the main products, prod the main targets were Latinos. Mm. So, um, so there's, uh, so, and don't be afraid to reach out to people for some help for the context too. So I want, there's a question here. I don't know how much time we have left. Michelle, do you? or Christine? About, about 10 minutes left. 10 minutes, okay. Um, that uh, Richard posed a while ago, um, and I wanted to make sure we didn't miss it. How do you get people to accept that previously accepted notions have little to no substance in fact? I, okay, I feel like I'm just yakking away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of the things, I think sometimes documenting when things came into, stories came into existence, um, kind of is going back to a really old fashioned, like how history works. So I remember, I can't, re it was a kind of a classic thing in, um, about George Washington and the cherry tree, kind of showing, um, this is a story that, I mean, I think Mason Weems said, I invented this. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's not true because, uh, um, because it's good for people to know, little kids to know. But I think one of the ideas is to show when a story comes into being. Um, so if George Washington had actually chopped down the cherry tree, you would have thought that this is something that would have, people would have been talking about it before he was, you know, as he be, was becoming a great man. Um, so some of it is talking about primary sources and documentation. The other is to say, why do you want, why is this story matter so much to you? 
Um, why does it, and, and again, growing up in the Midwest, there were a lot of stories about um, people assisting on the Underground Railroad and tunnels that uh, historic preservationists would say, there is no reason, like this is a cooling tunnel. This is not any, like it was built in the 1890s. Look at the brick, look at the, um, so part of it might be saying, why are, are you so invested in, under, in thinking that, the, that Iowa was part of the Underground Railroad when in fact, Iowa had laws saying that black people shouldn't settle there. So yeah. some of it is kind of getting at the emotional aspect of why this, why this matters, just like the emotional aspect. I mean, I don't think there's as many George Washington slept here signs around, but um, part, what, part of it was to say, we want to be associated with the first president. Um, that shows we matter. Um, I think listening to people's why, right? I mean, actually listening to them uh, within reason, you know, can help, right? The, 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 I imagine that uh, folks who, many of the folks who want to tell these stories uh, you don't have that many opportunities, <laughs> you know, that, that people aren't uh, necessarily listening to them. Um, so helping them to, you know, giving them that opportunity, but also then inviting them to listen to others and perhaps learn others' perspectives. Uh, I mean, one, one of the things about inclusive history, though, th that I've experienced is that, you know, it can really just change the conversation when you present someone with, with evidence. We've had, uh, for example, uh, great conversations here in Cooperstown when the fracking debate was really hot around natural resource extraction, around land use, around water. And you found, I found that, uh, you know, there, there were uh, lines of agreement that I didn't, didn't imagine would exist, you know, that there were people who were really committed environmentalists and uh, others who were, you know, farmers uh, uh, or, you know, not necessarily people who didn't necessarily see themselves as aligned with the environmental movement who, who agreed completely about the importance of clean water. Um, or, or if you use an oral history to, to, get, to get them thinking about one of these topics, all of a sudden it'll spark other memories. So they're not, they're not always just going back to the one story that they maybe heard in fourth grade from their teacher or, or, or maybe they heard when they visited the historic house museum in town, you know, when they were young. And, and so it, 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 it's more about their identity and about their connection to place than it is about sort of whether or not that history is, is factual. But maybe there are other stories that if you, if you present them with these other stories, and I find oral history a great way to do this, they'll make other connections and sort of you know, be opened to sharing in different ways. And that's usually when I'm approaching one of these topics, I'm thinking about how can I structure an experience or a conversation in a way that, you know, allows people to, invites people to share their perspectives, but then gets them moving in a little bit of a different direction because they're listening to somebody else or they're encountering a voice that they haven't heard before. Well, I think the key is you hit on is there are lots of stories out there, but we're the historians and we're the ones have to, who are bound by our professional ethics to bring the conversation back to um, interpretations that are fact-based. That's our role. Some people don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, look at how long it took to uh, change public attitudes about um, the cause of the Civil War. There are far fewer people today who um, believe that states' rights was the, was the cause, and I, I think it's generally accepted, except perhaps in Iowa, um, um, that slavery was the cause. It's, it seems undisputed that among many people who would have denied it in the past. Mm -hmm. But that's because of the good work of historians who have spent time documenting the facts to prove it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. our job. Mm -hmm. So Jason has a question that has come up in the chat. Go ahead, Jason, unmute yourself and ask. Yes, thank you. Hello. Um, where I live, there's a fair number of Blue Life 
matter flags and everything, which, as we know, is based on a counter protest slash racist roots against the Black Lives Matter movement. How do I, as a historian, go about documenting these things in a way that I won't seem like I'm trying to accuse or condemn these people because that's not my role, no matter how much I might agree or disagree with what they are doing or saying, but to just document it? Um, well, I could jump in here. You know, I, I've had a little bit of experience with this, not a whole lot, but um, again, I, I'm, I'm a narrative person. So, you know, inviting people to contribute their story or their perspective in a way that is open-ended, that is non, not judgmental, um, you know, can work, can be very effective in this context. Uh, they have to they have to trust you for that, um, and you 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 can't you, you can't guarantee them that you're going to give sort of their preferred interpretation. Um, but you you can give them the space to sort of share their perspective, and that could be around. I mean, there, there's an opportunity here with material culture. Um, you know, I, I, you, I think, alluded to the, the blue lives matter, the thin blue line flags that are, seem to be popping up everywhere. Um, perhaps it's, you know, tell a story around this. Uh, but it, it, it really is a process. I mean, I went through this process um, where, you know, I, I, I was working with somebody who really had a very kind of reactionary perspective on Black Lives Matter. Um, and it, it took several months of conversation to get to sort of a place of well, urging this person to sort of evaluate some of their assumptions, to look at the sources, and then also share their story. Um, it, 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 it wasn't an easy process and it wasn't a quick process. And I do think that right now in this moment, People are, you're going to find people might be defensive. And so you have to, you kind of have to break that down. Um, but you can't walk into it and say, you're, I'm going to, I'm going to interpret it in the way that you might want me to interpret it. But I might, but I am going to provide you with the space to kind of share your perspective. And and very, yeah, go ahead. And very quickly here, I don't underestimate the value of just collecting um, and documenting uh, what's yeah. going on with the Blue Lives Matter or any other topic. Um, yeah. I know in Schenectady where we have projects to uh, document both uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the response to COVID uh, because people are going to be dealing with this history many years from now. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think we're going to need to put an end to this session from looking at the chat. It looks like we could go on for quite a while still. But I want to thank our presenters. This has been a wonderful presentation. I think just from the questions we've seen that it's, it's an important topic. And I'm sure we'll be consider, continuing the conversation in future sessions. For those of you who did not get your questions answered, you know, feel free. I think that the, the presenters uh, have are willing to share their contact information. Will, I think you maybe had a slide on your slideshow you might want to put I up do, at this yeah, point I in time. Do. And also, you know, if you would like to see conversations around these topics continue, let your regional coordinators know because we'll be looking for ways to do regional meetings in the spring. And these are topics that we could bring up in your regional sessions as well. So let us know what you want to talk about. And with that, I want to invite you to get your lunch. We've got about an hour before our next formal session. But also, once you've gotten your lunch, pop into the William G. Found Pomeroy Foundation's virtual booth. Staff from that organization will be there to just chat with you and to answer your questions about the Pomeroy grant projects and the application process. So, and I will leave this session open to allow Will to get that contact information up for you. Um, okay, yep, yeah, I, I, uh, I threw it up there. I didn't. There we Everybody go. Everybody see it? Yes. Oops, sorry. There so you go. We'll, we'll leave that open. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. Thank you all very much. Uh, a, a virtual round of applause for our presenters. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully I'll be able to
get up there and visit you all sometime. <laughs> so <laughs> please do. We're hoping we can go to the Smithsonian again one one of these yeah. days. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Next year.